Iya. Oke. Okay. Oke, okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, in this this morning, we we are we are glad to have Dr. Himansu Raje or Dr. Raje from Nicole State of University USA, uh, and he will share his uh, experience. He will let us know more about bio the interesting topic that is bioinformatics. Uh, Professor Raje, uh, you know that we are most of us are engineers here yeah, with a little bit background on biology so uh in bioinformatics is a growing uh, growing topics and we should know about that but we have very little experience about that so you, we will be glad if you can share us and tell us more about what is bioinformatics okay the time is yours thank you thank you so much for such a nice introduction let me share my screen with you all real quick. Okay, great. So uh, like they said, I'm Dr. Himanshu Rajay. I'm assistant professor at Nicole State University. And thank you for having me to share some of my knowledge of bioinformatics with you all. This lecture, I have arranged it in such a way that it's going to be a little interactive, okay? So it's not going to be just me talking all the time. I would much appreciate your interaction, your responses. We are going to do several activities on computer, of course, um, but your participation and your outcomes of those activities would be much appreciated. They will essentially help me um, judge whether you're understanding or not. And feel free to ask questions as we move on through this presentation. I really like to answer questions during the lecture as well, okay? So if you do have questions, don't hesitate. I'll give you time to answer, uh, to ask questions. So if you do have questions, don't hesitate to put in the text chat window of Zoom and we'll take it from there. Also, I have a Google Drive folder and I'm gonna share that link with you all. So the activities that I told you about, the activities that we are gonna do throughout this lecture, um, we will have some files that I have uploaded onto that folder and we will use those. So as and when time comes, I'll tell you what and when we are using that folder on Google Drive and I'll share that link with you all in the text chat of the Zoom. Okay, bioinformatics is a fairly new science. So put it this way, it evolved after the invention of computers, much after in fact, the invention of computers because it involves computers, okay? So biology was advancing since centuries, I would say, but computers are themselves fairly new of an invention, a couple of decades ago. And that is when the thought started in people that can we use computer in other sciences like chemistry, like biology, like physics? Can we get help from this tremendous technology of computers to do certain tasks? And the answer to that was yes. And people actually started doing that. But when I was in my bachelor's degree, this word bioinformatics was completely new. It, I didn't even know about it. It barely existed. Um, and of course my bachelor's degree is from India. So I was completely unaware of bioinformatics at that time. But when I was in my master's degree and I had pretty much decided to go for biology at that time, that is when we were actually hearing or reading in news articles about bioinformatics but still it was not taught at colleges at that time as well. In fact, as you guys can probably understand that misconceptions circulate when the topic is like very new or fresh and there were misconceptions going on in the community. I still remember myself reading an article in a newspaper that of course it was a question mark, future of biology might be at stake because now computers will take over everything. Maybe computers can do experiments 
and what would biologists do? And while reading that news article, of course, I was just a master's degree student at that time. I was like, oh boy. I decided to take biology as my career and is this field in trouble? And at that same time, I remember having discussion with my parents. You know, we all have that kind of a phase at some point of time in our lives, what to do with our career. So um, we, me and my parents, we came across this one week of a workshop on bioinformatics at a city in India called as Chennai. It's really good for education. So my parents told me, why don't you fly over there? And why don't you see what this bioinformatics is about and see if your career is at stake, see what's the future of biology, what does it look like? And I did fly to Chennai for that one week workshop of bioinformatics. That trip to Chennai was kind of memorable for several things. First thing is, it was my first flight trip. Second thing is, I got introduced to bioinformatics. That was the first and foremost important thing. And I made really good friends over there. And the last, but not the least, in fact, the most important thing that I learned from that one week workshop on bioinformatics at Chennai is that biology is not in trouble. Biology still holds strong. We need biological experiments. We need to be in lab, but we also need help from this new technology that's coming up, computers. And maybe those computers can actually help us steer ourselves in a correct way while doing our experiments. So that was my take home message from that one week workshop that I attended on bioinformatics. And I, I was kind of intrigued by this science. So although I did not decide to do my career in bioinformatics, I stuck with molecular cell biology. I always try to keep myself updated with what's going on in this science. So like I said, we cannot proceed in bioinformatics without biology. So let's have a little bit of background on biology, okay? Just what's required. So let me just start off with important biomolecules. There are several molecules in our cells, not just our cells. We have bacterial cells, fungal cells. These cells behave as they behave and these cells interact using molecules. So it's pretty much like I always tell my students, these molecules are non-living, but their interaction with each other makes cells that are living. How does that happen? We really don't have full answer yet. And that's why still research is going on. So let's have a quick introduction of some of these important biomolecules that we are going to deal with in bioinformatics. Let's start with DNA. Let's start with a very familiar biomolecule, deoxyribonucleic acid. The genetic material for most of the cells, you name it, prokaryote, eukaryote, some viruses are different though. They are exceptions. However, viruses are not cells. So let's keep viruses aside for a while and let's just focus on DNA. The structure of DNA is double-stranded. I'm sure you have seen a picture or similar pictures like this um, on several occasions. So double-stranded, helical, the strands are anti-parallel, the monomer DNA is a long chain, okay, people? It's the monomer of DNA, the single unit is a nucleotide. And there are four of them in the DNA. Adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. They are represented by the single letter abbreviations, essentially coming from the first letter in their name. So A for adenine, T for thymine, etc. The chemistry, the rule of chemistry here is adenine A on one strand of DNA pairs with thymine T on the other strand of DNA. And guanine G on one strand pairs with cytosine C on the other strand of DNA. So keep this in mind. Some of you might already know this. If you know this, fine. If you don't know, well, just have a quick introduction about this. But notice here, there are a couple of points that we should note from this slide. The structure of DNA, the, that double helical, anti-parallel strands, 
is pretty much the same in any organism you talk about, okay? So that's one major biomolecule that we are going to look at, okay? So we have a sequence of DNA on one strand. Of course, it's a stretch of nucleotides. And of course, the other strand also has the same thing, the complementary sequence. That's what we call it. The second biomolecule that we are going to talk about is RNA, ribonucleic acid, okay? Notice the very first thing on this slide is rather than DNA just being a common structure, double helical structure, RNA has three types, messenger RNA, ribosomal RNA, and transfer RNA, okay? So there are three types of RNA. Another thing that you should keep in mind is whichever RNA we are talking about, the RNA is single stranded, okay? It is not double stranded like DNA. So no matter what RNA you talk about, messenger RNA, single stranded, ribosomal RNA and tRNA are also single stranded molecules, which means nothing prevents them to fold on to themselves and they can form structures like this, what's shown in this picture. Of course, not just this, they can even form several other kind of structures, okay? So keep that in mind. RNA comes in diverse forms because each and every molecule is single-stranded. Now, again, just to have a quick introduction, every gene can have, every protein-making gene, um, will have its own messenger RNA produced when cell expresses that gene. So messenger RNA is the molecule that's going to be produced from every gene that can make protein, okay? So when you think about messenger RNA, put it this way, ribosomes are going to read it in triplets and they are going to call corresponding tRNAs with amino acids and going to make proteins. So messenger RNA, we call it messenger because it carries message from genes. The other two RNA molecules, ribosomal RNA and transfer RNA, they never make proteins from themselves. They just help with protein formation. For example, ribosomal RNA just goes and becomes part of ribosome. Okay, so along with some other proteins, it just sits in cytoplasm and that's what ribosome is. It helps in formation of proteins. It helps to read these messenger RNAs and form proteins, but ribosomal RNA molecules are never going to form proteins from themselves. Ribosomes are not going to read these. Same thing applies to tRNA. These are again helper molecules. They help with protein synthesis, okay? So tRNA will never be formed into protein of itself, just helps. So the genes that code for ribosomal RNA, the genes that make transfer RNA, they never make proteins. They get expressed, but they just stop at RNA formation. And that RNA actually does perform some action in the cell. So that's RNA, of course, it is also made up of nucleotides. So the monomer of RNA are also nucleotides. Notice that there is no thiamine. Instead, we have a uracil in RNA molecules. And of course, if you are a biologist, you might know that tRNA has some other uncommon nucleotides in it, but that's not really the part of our lecture here. My attention is on uracil because that is the unique nucleotide in RNA and that replaces thiamine. But keep in mind that RNA is single-stranded. That should be the take-home message. And it comes in three types. It can fold onto itself to assume several different structures. So let's collect these information, collect these points with us, make a note of them and move on. The third, but the most diverse biomolecule is proteins. Proteins, there are several proteins in our cell, okay? Because every protein coding gene will have its own messenger RNA. And there are several of protein making genes. And those mRNAs will be read by ribosomes. Of course, ribosomes contain ribosomal RNA and transfer RNAs are going to come into picture with loaded amino acid. And we are going to have proteins. 
So nonetheless, the monomer here is amino acids. One amino acid is going to join to each other amino acid with peptide bond and form a chain of amino acid that is basically protein. However, just a simple chain of amino acid is a primary structure of protein, okay? These amino acids have their single letter abbreviations just like nucleotides do. And we are going to see, I'm going to point out to some of these um, single letter abbreviations to you later on when I show you certain bioinformatic things. But primary structure is a simple string of amino acids. If I keep writing single letter abbreviations of amino acids one after the other, that's a simple primary structure. That is not sufficient people for protein to work in the cell. I'm sure you guys know that each molecule, some of you are chemistry majors, some of you are biology majors, so you know that each molecule has its own three-dimensional shape. And when it assumes that shape, when it forms, um, when it takes that shape in the cell, that is when it can perform certain actions because that is when it can find its binding partners in the cell. Each protein is looking for something to bind to, something. It could be an ion, it could be another protein, it could be maybe sugar, something. And that structure of the binding partner of protein should perfectly fit into the three-dimensional structure of protein. And that is why no protein stops at primary structure. And if there, there are secondary structures like alpha helices, beta sheets, and even further, those secondary structures are folded in the cell to form a tertiary structure for every single protein, okay? So every single protein in the cell will have its own three-dimensional structure. Now, some proteins don't stop even here. Some proteins need to attach themselves to another protein. Cell needs to couple a couple of proteins together and that's when they can act. So they act together, they act in a group, bunch of proteins bound to each other. And so some proteins, not all, few proteins have something called as quaternary structure. So not all proteins have this, some proteins do, but the proteins that do have quaternary structure, it is basically proteins, different proteins attached to each other and performing a biological function. So again, for us, the take home message here is the monomer of protein is amino acid. It's an amino acid sequence. Three dimensional structure of protein comes into picture. It is critically important to know, okay? So keep these things in mind and let's move ahead. Although I have shown you a eukaryotic cell, you can see this, this is a nucleus of the cell. Even prokaryotic cells have the same process going on from DNA. This is where we essentially start. This is where the genes are. This is the genetic material of every cell. This houses all the genes. Now when cell, any cell, prokaryote or eukaryote, us, plants, animals, bacteria, whatever, when the cell decides to activate a gene, it will form an RNA molecule from that gene, okay? And the process of going from DNA to RNA is called as transcription. So when a gene is activated, that gene is going to be transcribed. Now, I just told you a few seconds ago that some genes go all the way down to protein. So their RNA molecules are messenger RNAs and they will further be translated with the help of ribosomes and a protein will form from them. Some genes can do that, but what if we are talking about a gene that just makes ribosomal RNA or a transfer RNA? That kind of RNA will never ever form its own protein. But still, when a ribosomal RNA gene is activated, we will have transcription of that gene and we will form ribosomal RNA, okay? But those genes will stop here. So as a whole class, we can settle on a thought that when a gene is activated, it is at least getting transcribed. Now, if we are talking about messenger RNAs, they will also get translated with the help of ribosomes and form proteins. 
Keep in mind that these three are extremely diverse molecules. I mean, we are talking about a stretch of nucleotides, double-stranded, anti-parallel helical molecule here. With a process of transcription, it is forming a single-stranded molecule of RNA, okay? And I'm going to come to the technicalities here, okay? So keep that in mind. RNA are single-stranded, formed from a double-stranded molecule. Still, the monomer is nucleotide, but thymine is replaced by uracil. And here, if messenger RNAs are translated to proteins, then this is a whole different biomolecule in itself. The monomer is amino acids. So cell is doing an incredible thing here. Cell is creating three different kinds. Of course, this is what cell has already, but cell is essentially creating two completely diverse molecules and there are several proteins. So we have tremendous amount of diversity here. And this is, this whole process together is called a central dogma of molecular biology, okay? Because this holds true for prokaryotes as well as eukaryotes. So we are going to stick to this central dogma and we are going to appreciate this diversity in biomolecules that we see. And we are going to try and see how that fits within the information that we can collect from these biomolecules. I want your attention for now on this process, transcription. How come from a double-stranded DNA molecule, we have a single-stranded RNA? The process happens kind of like this. Here we have double-stranded DNA, okay? This is where the gene, so in this picture, a gene is shown to you right here, just a cartoon of a gene, two strands of DNA. Since RNA is single-stranded, when cell decides to activate, mark my words, okay, letter by letter, when cell decides to activate this gene, the two strands of DNA are going to separate. And cell is going to recruit an enzyme to read, keep your focus on my mouse pointer, to read just one strand of DNA and form an RNA molecule. So only one strand of DNA is going to be used to form an RNA molecule. Makes perfect sense to us because RNA is single-stranded. Cell is never going to use both of these DNA strands and form a double-stranded RNA. That's not how it happens. RNA is rarely double-stranded. If it is double-stranded, then it is the single-stranded RNA folded onto itself. That's it. Otherwise, RNA is single-stranded, so only one strand of DNA is used. The strand of DNA that cell is going to use to make RNA is called as template strand. Keep that name in your mind somewhere. We are going to come to this name at least a couple of times today. And the other strand of DNA is called as a coding strand or the sense strand. This strand of DNA is not used to form RNA, okay? Maybe this figure, would do um, a better judgment to the point that I'm trying to make. So this strand of DNA, it's shown in red color to you. There are no real colors in DNA. This is just for our understanding. But this strand of DNA has this sequence, let's say, for example, it's not being used to make RNA by cell. In fact, this bottom strand of DNA, that's being used. That's a template strand. It acts as a template for RNA formation. So as you can see, the sequence of RNA is complementary to the template strand, okay? If we have T in the template strand, cell will add A in the RNA. And of course, if it's, there is adenine in the template strand, RNA doesn't have T, but it has U instead. We learned that a few seconds ago. So cell will put U. But the point to note here is the sequence of RNA is going to be complementary. These nucleotides pair to each other, to the template strand of DNA. And if you go back a second and look at this strand of DNA, the other coding strand of DNA, that strand of DNA was also complementary to this strand of DNA, because usually these two strands of DNA bind to each other. Now we have RNA, which is complementary to this strand. This strand of DNA is also complementary to the template strand. So 
the sequence, look at the sequence of RNA. The sequence of RNA perfectly matches with the sequence of coding strand of DNA, apart from the T's replaced by U's. Okay, so keep that in mind. The sequence of RNA is the same exact sequence just because both of these strands are complementary to template strand. Template strand of DNA, the other strand of DNA is acting as a template to form RNA. And that is why most of the databases in bioinformatics, they will provide you with this sequence. You will see the coding strand sequence, okay? The sequence that is very exactly, in fact, exactly similar to the RNA sequence. So if you are looking at a gene sequence in a database, and if you wonder, hey, what would be the RNA sequence here? All you have to do is just replace those T's by U's and that's your RNA sequence. And that is why databases, biological databases, give you the coding strand sequence, okay? So keep that in mind. And again, some of these things might sound um, like, you know, um, foreign to you right now, but when we actually look at those biological databases, trust me, it will all make sense, as long as you're trying to keep up with the pace. So coding strand is the sequence that we see. All right, when biological inventions were taking place, when scientists were discovering how are these genes expressed and a lot of expression data um, was essentially piling up in scientific community, when human genome project was going on, people had questions in their mind. Humans have lots of genes, human cells have tremendous amount of genes in them. What is their sequence? What is the DNA sequence of each gene? And there was a worldwide collaborative project to sequence the entire human genome. It generated tremendous amount of data. Now where to keep that data? We needed some help to preserve that data. We cannot just preserve that data on paper. If we do that, it will just remain in one lab or maybe at one place we wanted scientific community wanted access of that data to worldwide. It wanted outreach. People in the world, everybody should have access to that data. And so where to store that data? That is when people looked into some other sciences like computer science. Can we get help from computers? Maybe to store this data? Is computer science advanced enough? Now, luckily, fortunately, even computers were evolving around the same time. And the answer came to be yes. Yes, we can get help from computers and store this data. Furthermore, not only just store, we can even try and analyze this data to draw some meaningful conclusions. We all do experiments, people, in lab at some point of time. Even otherwise, our life is full of experiments, essentially, in no matter in what science you talk about. Even in other subjects, people do some types of experiments. We, we know two things by doing an experiment, no matter whether it's chemistry, whether it's physics, whether it's biology. Experiment takes time. And sometimes the reagents that we use for these experiments are costly. They take money. Now, if we, and typically, we don't know the outcome of experiment. We are doing research. When we start off with an experiment, we don't know what's going to be an outcome. We can kind of predict our hypothesis, but we don't, real, we don't even know whether we are going to be heading into right direction or not, typically. And that is where decades ago, people were trying to get any help possible from computer science. Can we at least virtually predict the outcome of an experiment? Can we at least know if we are heading into right direction in order for us to save time and money? There is no point in spending five years doing an experiment only to realize that I was chasing shadows. If I can get periodic help from computers, computer will not be doing any experiment for me. However, I am going to just check with computer, maybe plan out my experiment in computer we call it as in vitro experiment. The experiment that we do with animals are in vivo, but experiment that we do in a test tube are, are in vitro. And the experiments that we do with computers are in silico because they have silicon chip. 
So these are three different words that um, we need to kind of keep somewhere in our mind. But can we do some of those in silico experiments and periodically judge, maybe on a monthly basis, maybe on bi-monthly basis, just to see if our experiments are going in the right direction or not. If we can do that, we can modify our hypothesis and always steer ourselves at the right direction. And that's what I'm going to focus my lecture on today, okay? I'm going to introduce you, again, this is just introductory bioinformatics. So I'm just going to introduce you to some pre-existing tools in bioinformatics. How can we use those in our day-to-day -day experiments, day-to-day -day biological experiments? Some of those tools you can even use in chemistry or you can even use in bioprocess. So it's going to be interesting. Some of you are all, might already be familiar with some of those tools. So if you are, that's fantastic. You will be able to do those activities very quickly. If you are not, um, you will learn those. So that's going to be knowledge to you all, okay? So stay tuned. Some interesting stuff is going to come to you. The point here on this slide that I want to make before I leave this slide is there is tremendous amount of data in biology that is being generated. Okay, and we are actually going to talk about what kind of data that we are talking about. Well, first thing is right in front of us, the nucleic acid sequence. So let's see what type of data we can gather in biology, shall we? And this is where informatics comes into picture. Wherever we have data, we have information. And in this, it is the information in context of biology. And that is where this culmination of biology and computer information technology, IT, or computers is essentially what bioinformatics is all about. And this led to starting of a whole new field. Nowadays, people do careers in bioinformatics. There are majors named as bioinformatics in colleges because this has tremendous potential. Keep in mind though, we can never ever do any earth-shaking discovery with bioinformatics. I mean, just in bioinformatics. We need to do biological experiments in order to invent new things. We can use bioinformatics. We can get help from computers only to assist us with our biological experiments. So that is one thing to bear in our mind real well. And now it's time, since we are now introduced to informatics, it's time to look into what kind of data we can collect in biology. And we are actually going to make this slide together, okay? Um, as you can see, this slide is almost blank and it has those three familiar biomolecules with us. So I'm going to um, stop my slideshow for a while and I'm back to that text box that I have there. With biomolecule DNA, what kind of data can we get? And we are going to finish this slide. We're going to complete this slide together. So again, I, I would much appreciate your input as I complete this slide. I'm going to use DNA as my biomolecule. Okay, I'm going to complete DNA, but you guys are going to help me with RNA and proteins. So let's start with DNA. Of course, we can have nucleotide sequence. That is a data. So nucleotide. sequence could be a data for DNA. The structure of DNA is pretty much the same in any organism we talk about. So I wouldn't put structure, there is barely any diversity there. So I wouldn't put it as a diversified data for DNA, okay? Uh, however, nucleotide sequence, definitely yes. How about this? There are four different types of nucleotides in DNA, A, T, G, and C. Sometimes it's important to know how many A's, how many adenines are there in DNA, how many thymines, cytosines, or guanines. So percentage of each nucleotide that could be some meaningful information. The other meaningful information here would be if I have one DNA molecule sequence, how similar that is with the other DNA molecule sequence. For example, let's talk about us. Let's talk about humans. 
we have several genes in our body. I can take a common example, hemoglobin. It's the protein that carries oxygen in us. Of course, it's a protein which is coming from its own gene. So gene of hemoglobin, there are, there are several globins in our cells, but that gene, how similar is that gene in its nucleotide sequence with mouse hemoglobin? If you have that kind of a question, you need to first obtain human hemoglobin gene sequence, compare it, of course, obtain mouse hemoglobin gene sequence and compare both of them with each other. There is a scientific word to it. There is a bioinformatic word to it. You got to align those sequences with each other. So sequence, alignment that could be a form of data for dna okay if you can think of something else feel free to put in the text chat window okay as we speak so sequence alignment or percent homology these are some words that we should keep in mind between several DNA molecules. Okay, can somebody tell me what kind of data can we have for RNA? We can always go back to DNA if something strikes to us. RNA, unlike DNA, has several types. We just learned about that. So if you can put your thoughts in the text chat window of Zoom, I would much appreciate that. What kind of data can we have for RNA? Of course, nucleotide sequence. Any other thoughts? Types of RNA, I love that, yes, types of RNA for sure. So let's put that right here. There are three types of RNA. If I show you just a nucleotide sequence of RNA, I'm not telling you much here. You might ask me, is this mRNA? Is this rRNA or tRNA? So type of RNA, fantastic. Any other thing that you can think of? RNA is single-stranded. So I told you some peculiarities about RNA. RNA structure, fantastic. We are all learning together. The structure of RNA. In parentheses, I'm going to write um, folding pattern. Transcriptomics, yes. So we can have a set of RNA molecules in a cell. All of those RNA molecules have definitely come from expression, transcription of certain genes. So if we have a question, hey, here is a cell, how many different RNA molecules are there in the cell? And what is their sequence? That is transcriptome, just like genome. Genome is a set of genes in our cells. Transcriptome is a set of RNA in our cells. So set of RNA in a cell. Let's stick to simple English in parentheses. Transcriptome. Fantastic people, this is going well. Any other things you can think of for RNA? Translation start point and end points that holds true for mRNA for sure, yes. Messenger RNA, the RNA molecule that forms proteins, it has to have some starting point 
for protein synthesis and some ending point, which means it has to have a start codon somewhere, okay? And it has to have a stop codon, which tells ribosomes where to start making protein and where to stop making that protein. So that whole sequence of RNA, the whole sequence of messenger RNA, now I'm fine tuning my words. I'm building upon this answer. From start to stop codon is called as ORF, open reading frame. The whole sequence of messenger RNA from start to stop codon, it is imperative to predict open reading frames for messenger RNAs. Fantastic, yes, what else? Which mRNA is expressed in certain conditions? Yes, conditional expression. That kind of goes with transcriptomics, but yes, conditional expression of RNA is kind of important. Some cells, some, some genes are expressed only under stressed conditions. So what are those genes? It's important to know that. Okay, so definitely nucleotide sequence, definitely the type, definitely the structure of RNA, definitely the um, conditional expression, the transcriptome. That is good. Any other thing that you can think of for RNA? Otherwise we will go to proteins. We can always go back. What about proteins, people? What type of data can we have here? Protein sequence and structure, yes. So let's say amino acid sequence, shall we? That's the primary structure of every protein. Simple amino acid sequence by their single letter abbreviation. Structure, three dimensional structure of protein is critically important for its function. And so it is almost very critical, tremendously important to be able to predict. If I just give you a simple amino acid sequence of a protein, my question is, will you be able to at least predict solving a full three-dimensional structure that takes time. It takes involving and money-consuming techniques such as X-ray crystallography or 3D cryo electron microscopy, etc. Before going to that, can you at least predict? Has any other organism been shown to have a similar protein of the 3D structure? So yes, we, we, we can definitely look at the 3D structure of the protein. What else? What else can we look into protein? Aha, I like that. Protein function. Thank you, people. I told you proteins are the most diverse biomolecules in the cell and they come with variety of functions. Functions are their own. So what is the function of the protein of our interest? If we have just the sequence of the protein, if we can predict the three-dimensional structure of the protein or just the sequence matches, let's say that we are looking into a human protein, human hemoglobin, let's say for example, hemoglobin carries oxygen. Let's say that we are looking into human hemoglobin protein sequence, just the amino acid sequence. If we can somehow match that sequence with all of the plant proteins that are known. And if we do see some similarity with that, maybe that protein in plant can also carry oxygen, maybe, just because maybe this is just prediction and that's what bioinformatics helps us with. It helps us to do meaningful, to, to uh, generate meaningful predictions. And we can test those predictions furthermore with real experiments. So yes, the function of protein essentially any other factor that might matter into biological data for protein. How about this um, conditional, again, um, formation of protein or synthesis? How about that? Just like RNA, some proteins are made only under certain conditions. 
like most of the antibodies are made only when we have infection. Okay, there are some antibodies that are made even without, but there are some proteins that are made only under stress conditions. There are some proteins that are always being made. Homology, fantastic, yes. Amino acid sequence homology. How similar one protein is to the other protein. And that kind of thing can be in RNA as well. Wherever you have some kind of sequence, we can definitely have sequence homology, sequence alignment. Any other thing you can think of? This is, this is going tremendously well, people. Thank you. Thank you for your feedback. Any other things? Aha, protein interactions. That relates to what I just told you a few minutes ago. Protein wants to find binding partners. So what other molecules does it bind to? How does it interact in the cell? Is it, now that brings to another point. Cellular location of the protein. That's also important. Some proteins are membrane proteins. Some proteins are just with, remain within the cell. Some proteins are secreted out of the cell. Okay, so where does this protein go? That is also important. Any other thing that you can think of? How about RNA splicing? Yes. Fantastic. RNA splicing. In parentheses, we can write alternative splicing in eukaryotes. I deliberately avoided this because not everyone knows. This is kind of a complicated topic, alternative splicing. But I'm glad somebody mentioned this. Fantastic. Any other things in protein? In fact, I would like to add something in DNA now. How about name of the gene? If we are really looking into a gene sequence, because there could be several other DNA several other stretches of nucleotides that may or may not be a gene. If we are looking into the gene, then it's good to have the name of that gene, its location. Remember, DNA is the genetic material. Chromosomal location, where exactly on chromosome that gene is present. Are there any diseases associated with that gene? What if that gene sequence um, might have some mutations in some people? If they do have mutations, then what diseases could they have? So diseases or disorders associated with specific genes. You know what people, every single point that we are putting on this slide, there is a database out there for that. There are databases out there that correlate the name of the gene with diseases. There are databases out there that have um, homology between um, several genes between different organisms. We are going to touch upon some of those. There are databases out there to tell you protein three-dimensional structure. There are databases out there to analyze the whole transcriptome, no matter what organism you talk about. So things have advanced quite far. 
we are going to just touch upon those databases and just some of the widely used databases. That's the whole point of today's lecture, okay? So this is going well. Let's move on. Let's keep this slide. This is a slide in progress always, okay? So now I think it's time for me to introduce you two common biological databases that house gene sequences. One of them was originated in America. The other one tells us essentially the same thing, but it's originated in Europe, okay? So American one is NCBI GenBank, National Center for Biotechnology Information, and the European one is Embel Bank. These two databases house gene sequences. Of course, there are protein sequences that are housed by these two databases. They essentially are different versions American and European version of the same data. So there is redundancy, there is correlation between these two databases. And there is interrelations, in fact. For today, we will stick with the American version of the database, just because it is more user friendly. However, we are going to use some cool tools from this Embel bank, okay? And there are many more databases that I have not even listed on this slide. There are some specific databases. What if GenBank houses the gene sequences from all organisms that are sequenced like humans, mice, fruit flies, worms, plants. But what if we just want to look into fruit fly sequences? Then there is a database for that fly base. What if we want to look at just plant gene sequences, then there are some small databases just for that. So there are some specific ones, but as of now, we are going to stick to GenBank. And again, I'm going to just stop slideshow for a while and I'm going to share my browser screen with you. I'm going to show you one critical thing to do, how to search for a gene sequence in a GenBank. Okay, so let me stop sharing my screen and let me be back with my web browser. Here we go. What I'm gonna do is in the search window, I'm just going to type NCBI GenBank that is GenBank. Notice that there are several sister databases in GenBank. There are nucleotide sequence databases, in which case you will select a nucleotide. There are genome databases. There are gene expression omnibus GEO database. Let's start off with gene. This also houses some free textbooks, by the way, people. There are book databases as well in there. Let's start with gene. And you can pretty much type your favorite organism and the name of your favorite gene in here. My favorite gene in humans is actin. So let's search for human, A-C-T-B, beta actin. Just an example, later on we will search for some other genes as well. I'm just going to show you how to search for a gene. And this is where you will get a gene card for that gene, beta actin. Make sure that we are looking into human gene. Click on that. That will take you to an NCBI page for that gene. The name of the gene right up front. There is some summary. You can get some meaningful information about this gene, okay? Um, you can also get some information about the expression pattern of this gene. In which human tissues is this gene expressed? Well, it tells you ubiquitous expression several tissues. First of all, it is a protein coding gene. Keep going down. I'm just going to quickly scroll. If you are a biologist, you will have also actually appreciate this little interactive browser. It tells you a cartoon of the structure of that gene and tells you some meaningful information about how many exons, how many protein making sequences are there, how many introns are there and um, where do they start, where do they end? So as you hover your mouse pointer on that, it tells you that information. Keep going down. If the experiment is done by some people, some scientists out there in the lab, this graph will pop up and this is the expression data. 
I like actin gene because it's expressed in every single human tissue, in every single pretty much human cell. And that's what this graph tells you, okay? You can also change the type of experiment over here from the drop-down menu and see several other types of graphs. But again, that's reserved for some advanced things. Let's move on. What other things does this web page show you? Of course, several references, the people, names of the people that worked on um, this data. Associated conditions. Are there any mutations associated with this gene? If so, what kind of diseases or disorders or syndromes can humans get? You can have that information right there. Okay, so without any, without going anywhere onto Google, just in this database itself, you can do this for any gene. And there are several other things down there. What mutations you can have? What kind of interactions does this protein do? To which other proteins it can interact? Maybe it can interact with some viral proteins. So you will find all kinds of interactions and the associated research studies listed right here on this web page. The most important thing that I want to point out is, what if I want to know this gene sequence? In that case, you have to go up right here where you see this interactive browser. Um, if you are a biologist, again, feel free to look around, but click on this link, GenBank. That will take you to the sequence of that gene. And that is the sequence. Okay, we are get, getting to that page. It doesn't tell you that it's human actin. It just tells you that human actin gene is on human chromosome seven. And of course the earlier page also had that information. This number though is a unique database ID for human actin gene. So if you are a researcher working on this gene, you better note down this ID so that you can refer to this same gene sequence in future. You can almost just put this number in the search window and you will be coming directly to this page. This also tells you how long is the nucleotide sequence. So about um, 3,454 base pairs. So about 3,400 base pairs. It's a linear DNA. Keep scrolling down. It tells you the names of people who submitted this sequence. Make a note of this section, features. It tells you that of course, it's genomic DNA, all the way starting from the first nucleotide to the last nucleotide. It also tells you that it's a gene. The name of that gene is ACTB. And all of that sequence, starting from first to the last nucleotide, is the same gene. It also tells you the mRNA sequence for that gene, okay? It asks you to join several nucleotides to make an mRNA. Now you might be thinking, oh, do I have to manually join these nucleotides? No, no, no. Look, look under the subheading under this mRNA transcript ID. Just click on that and it will take you to just the mRNA sequence for that gene. There you go, mRNA. If you scroll down, that is just the mRNA sequence. Of course, replace T's by U's, okay? It also gives you the coding DNA sequence, just the exons of the gene. And what would the protein sequence look like? So this is the protein sequence. These are single letter abbreviations of the amino acids. So every single information that you need to know is right there on this page. If you want to know just the coding sequence separately, just click on this external link, CCDS and that will take you to just this sequence. It asks you to manually join these nucleotides. You don't have to, just click on that link. And then we have a full gene sequence starting from first nucleotide to the very last nucleotide right here. Now notice that this sequence has numbers, okay? Nucleotide number positions. What if you want to work with this sequence? What if you want to do some analysis with the sequence and you want to get rid of these numbers? You can do a simple trick. Just copy this whole thing. Copy and go to this website. This is a fantastic sequence manipulation suite online software developed by University of Alberta in Canada. It has several 
free tools for us to play around, okay? We are just going to look at some of these. For example, filter DNA, whatever other non-DNA characters you might have. What if somebody gives you a word file of DNA sequence with some other characters? You don't want those characters because those characters will be thrown off by any bioinformatics software. In that case, just run your sequence through this. I mean, it gives you an example sequence, just clear that off and paste our sequence in here and hit submit. What it gives you is the sequence without numbers. And now you can play around with this sequence, okay? It is also in some kind of a format, which I'll tell you what that format is. I think I'm not really sharing this screen with you. So let me go back and share my whole desktop. I can see your screen before. Oh, you could? You could see the output? I saw your cut and paste. Oh, okay. Um, no, this is the output. Here we go. So now we don't have numbers, we have just the sequence, okay? Filter DNA sequence, it gives a name to it. And I want you guys to notice this sign, the greater than sign that starts off with the sequence. That greater than sign signifies something. It's a format of a sequence that this software, online software converts our sequence to. It's called as FASTA format. And that's what we are going to come to now. So let me unshare my screen and let me put the PowerPoint back up since we had some introduction about genes right here. The FASTA format. A lot of bioinformatics softwares don't accept just the DNA sequence. It has to be in this FASTA format. We call it FASTA. And what it means is whatever sequence you are looking into, put this greater than sign in front of it. And that helps computer to know that this is where computer should start reading the sequence. And now you can list multiple sequences, one after the other, as long as you start every sequence with a greater than sign. You can even, you are allowed to put certain name for that sequence. So greater than sign, whatever unique name you want to put for this sequence, you can even type in simple English, like human beta actin, something like that. And, um, you know, mouse beta actin, something like that. And don't be under impression that you have to have a limited number of nucleotides. No, you can go on to like thousands of nucleotides here and then put another greater than sign and put your second sequence. Put another greater than sign, put your third sequence. So that is a fast start format of a sequence. Now, how can we get that? Well, fortunately, it is easy for us to get any sequence on GenBank in FASTA format. GenBank has made that real easy. Um, let me go back to the browser that we were working with, and that will be more clear to you. I'll show you right there how you can go to FASTA format of any sequence from GenBank. Here we go. We are back to that beta actin gene sequence of humans on chromosome seven. There is a link here for every single GenBank entry, FASTA, just click on that. And you will get the whole sequence into FASTA format. There you go. You see that familiar greater than sign, you see some name. So all you can do is just copy paste this sequence into any kind of bioinformatics software that you want to use it with. You can do one more thing. If you want a standalone file, standalone FASTA file from this sequence, all you got to do is just click send to file and select format FASTA and say create file. This will actually download a FASTA file of that sequence on your computer. If you have some software installed on your computer, you can use this feature. 
okay? Um, there are several other tools that you can use. In fact, you can sign into NCBI using one of your Google account and that can save, you can have your favorite searches saved. You can play around with this NCBI. It's all free and in open domain. If you want to search something within this sequence, there is a feature in NCBI to do that. All you have to do is go here, find within this sequence, okay? So the most important thing is now you know how to obtain FASTA sequences of any DNA sequence from GenBank. We are going to use that skill and I'm going to share my screen back with you and give you the very first assignment, okay? And that's going to be kind of interesting. So let's go back to my PowerPoint. We are going to play around a little now with these DNA sequences. It's time for that. Here we have, I have assembled, it's not me, I have just put together these several coronavirus whole genome sequences. Here we have the SARS-CoV-2 right at the bottom. Okay, that's causing COVID. We, have, we are living with pandemic these days. A similar one to that is SARS-CoV. Of course, there is one Middle Eastern variant and there are several other coronaviruses. And these links will take you to their full viral genome sequences on GenBank. Your job is to obtain them in FASTA format and then go to this link to align them with each other. And we are going to actually do a multiple sequence alignment. The software will do it for us to see which of these viral sequences are similar to each other and which of them differ from each other. So let me go to this link real quick and show you how it kind of looks like. Um, now, again, I might have lost that shared screen but I will share my entire desktop with you all so you can see everything in there. Okay, here we have the Clustal Omega web server. I'll just align sample sequences for you. We are aligning DNA. We just load example sequences in there. Notice that they are in FASTA format. So when you copy and paste your whole coronavirus genomes, make sure you post them with the FASTA format next to each other. Okay, other than that, leave the default parameters just like that and just hit submit and let the server do its job. It's going to take some time to run and it gives you the alignment. When it gives you the alignment, the first thing you should do is go to this guide tree and that tells you which two sequences are highly similar to each other and the third one is a little distant. So people start doing this. Start gathering those sequences uh, from my PowerPoint slide. I'm actually going to share um, the Google Drive folder link with you. Now it's time to do that. And I'll give you about five, 10 minutes for this activity and we will further move on to the next one, okay? So let me stop sharing and go back to my PowerPoint so that you can see There you go. If you can click on these links, you can get those sequences from right here. Otherwise, I'm gonna show you and I'm gonna share that link of Google Drive folder with you. The same text you will find it as, as activity one. But start doing this. And if you can get to that cladogram, the guide tree, click on guide tree. If you can get that, then screenshot it and maybe post it in the same folder. I have given you edit access for that. I'm posting that link um, in a few seconds. Okay, here we go. Here is the link to the Google Drive folder. So this is your time. Start working uh, on that alignment. I'll put Dr. My... Human, yeah. could you please maybe uh, uh, share that last slide again? Yes. Thank you.
that. If you guys can get to um, the guide tree cladogram, post it either in Zoom text chat or post it into our Google Drive folder right there. As long as we have a couple of responses, we can safely move on to next activity, but I'm going to give you a few minutes to do this and then we'll move on. So we have some questions. How in DNA is not a sequence of, DNA is a sequence of nucleotide, but percentages of nucleotides in DNA could be a form of data. And same thing holds true for RNA as well. So percent A, percent U in RNA or percent T in RNA. We need to know that kind of a thing for certain experiments that we do in biology. Again, that's beyond this just introductory lecture. But if you are a biologist or if you are studying um, advanced biology, you will come across percent AT or percent GC of a DNA. Somebody said that protein modification, yes, that should be included into protein data. Some proteins are post-translationally modified. They receive phosphate groups or methyl groups or acetyl groups that needs to be added into protein modification. Good job, fantastic. If someone can get cladogram done, either post it in this text chat window or um, upload it to that Google Drive folder. That web server might take some time to run because these are huge sequences. So you can just get the job running and we can move on after a few minutes with the PowerPoint. And um, as long as the job, as, as soon as the job runs, we can have the outcome of this activity. This same slide is available as activity one document in our Google Drive folder. So um, you can get the same links from that activity one Google Doc in our folder. Thank you, mister. Hi, I can't add any at Nickel Dipuna. I can't any super chai.
Maybe I'll give you a minute to get this job in Costa Omega started, and then we will move on. I have to explain you a couple of other activities. Get the job moving, submit the job, and then the web server does the magic. Let Costa Omega web server do its job. And once the results come, we can have a look at them. You can just screenshot the cladogram and upload it. Maybe put your name as file name. That would be perfect. Okay, hopefully people have gotten these links. If you have not, then the same document is on Google Doc. So for now, let's move on a little. Keep this job going. If you have submitted the job to Costa Omega web server, let it run. It will run on its own. And whenever it's done, you will see the results right in front of you on that web page. This is how the outcome should kind of look like, okay? So um, these are the accession numbers of all of those five different coronaviruses. And here we have SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2. Now, just by those names, they should be similar. We, our common sense can tell us that, but cladogram wise, the nucleotide, the genome sequence wise also, they are the most similar, okay? Then comes the Middle Eastern version and these two other human coronaviruses are a little distant. That's how, so this cladogram generated by Cluster Omega, you yourself will generate a similar cladogram, okay? In a few minutes, it pretty, pretty much matches with biological observation. So that's, that's our expected outcome for this activity. The other thing that we can play around is this NCBI blast. In previous activity, we aligned individual sequences with each other. In this, using this basic local alignment search tool, you can have a sequence and align it to the whole genome of certain organism. Okay, so if I have a short nucleotide sequence and I want to know, do humans have this sequence? Well, just put it into BLAST and blast it against human genome. So let me again uh, demonstrate it to you real quick by sharing my screen, entire screen rather, so I'll be back in a second with my whole screen share. And we are going to look at NCBI BLAST. Here we go. NCBI BLAST. Basic local alignment search tool. Go to nucleotide blast. And you can pretty much put any DNA sequence right here. Okay, that is the sequence. Keep this the same. Oops. If you want to search it against certain organism, you can type the name of that organism right here. For example, Homo sapiens. There you have it. If you want to just search it in all of the genomes, it houses the genomes of every single organism for which the genomes are sequenced. Then just leave it blank and just hit blast. And you will see the outcome within a few seconds. The job keeps running. Within a few seconds, it will be blasted. And if there is some significant similarity, it will tell you exactly what it matches with. So that random sequence that I um, showed you matches with several of these things. It tells you the name of either protein or organism and um, the percent homology, like 100% match or 50%, whatever that is. So we are going to do another activity. You have five different patient sequences right here in your Google Drive folder. So if you go to Google Drive within our folder, there is a file, 
Oops, I don't see it here. Um, patient sequences. I can upload it. There you go. Get this file. This file have um, five se DNA sequences from patients. So we know that, you know, if a patient is, if someone is infected with some kind of a pathogen, either bacterial or viral, there are several methods to diagnose that infection. However, if you are a molecular biologist, you can take that tissue, infected tissue sample, and just isolate DNA from it and sequence it, okay? So by sequencing, you will have human DNA, of course, but if that patient is infected by some other pathogen, you will have that pathogen's genome as well. So my question to you is, take these sequences individually and blast them. Don't put any, um, don't blast them against human or any specific organism, just put them in the query window of blast right here, NCBI blast. So let's go back to blast, nucleotide blast. So just copy and paste. You don't even have to copy that greater than sign. Just copy and paste those sequences one by one though, one patient at a time. Make sure you don't put any organism and just hit blast. If all of the results show you just homo sapiens, then that person is not infected. One of those patients is infected by something. If somebody can make out what patient number that is and what is that pathogen that that person is infected with and put that in the text chat window, that would be fantastic. Okay, so I'm going back to um, my PowerPoint for a while, but you have all of those five patient sequences. So start working on that on, on your web browsers. One by one, put the patient sequence in here and click blast. You can have multiple windows going on depending on your internet speed of blast and maybe blast all five of those simultaneously and see what are the hits. If all of the hits are from homo sapiens, then that person just has, you know, we just sequence people's own DNA, person's own DNA, human DNA. But if some other hits pop up, like for example, some bacterial name, then we would like to know what that name is or if it is some viral name. I would much appreciate if you can put that name in the text chat window. Okay, so we will see which patient is infected and infected by what. And I'll give you maybe three or so minutes. Let's see if somebody can come up with the answer. Patient three is infected by SARS-CoV-2. Fantastic job, yes. So see, a simple blast search can tell you several things. Fantastic job, people, thumbs up. So within no time, you guys can tell this answer by using open source, publicly available tools, okay? So that is the skill that we should learn from these bioinformatics softwares. We can have real quick answers, nothing or checking discovery, but these in silico experiments, the things that we do on computer, can really help us in biology. So in reality, you would actually have to sample the tissue of the patient, isolate the DNA, sequence the DNA. Once you have the sequence with you, this is exactly the thing that you will do. Okay, so that's the power of bioinformatics. Fantastic. People who are still working on that, keep working. 
we will move on on the PowerPoint. You will have these sequences with you, trust me. And later on, we will have time for questions. We have a couple of more interesting activities for you guys to do. So let's pick up our PowerPoint right from here and let's move a little ahead. You just did that. Another topic. Now this might be interesting to some of you, genetic engineering. Can we put a human gene and make tons and tons of a protein from that gene by using bacteria synthetically? I mean, we, if technically, if we want to um, maybe make a growth hormone for humans, we cannot isolate it from humans. That has several ethical and other issues to deal with. However, we can take the gene from humans and we can put it into bacteria and let bacteria grow. And those bacteria are very fast to grow. Within 24 hours or so, you will have millions of bacterial cells and they would have produced tons of the proteins that you want, pro protein molecules that you want from that gene. That technology is recombinant DNA technology. Of course, all of this has to happen in lab, but can we plan it out on computer? The answer to that is yes. And this is how you do that. In order to know how this works, we need to have a couple of background of what bacteria have. They are simple cells. They don't have nucleus. Their DNA is just in their cytoplasm. But some bacterial cells have these special DNA molecules called as plasmids. These are circular DNA molecules. If a bacteria has these, then typically these plasmids give them antibiotic resistance. So they have those antibiotic resistant genes on them. Okay. Other thing that you need to know is now this, this cartoon shows you this, 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 this is just one specific plasmid, PUC, University of California, 19. This is ampicillin resistance gene. Of course, it's DNA. So it will have its own DNA sequence. And of course, it has several other things. But an important thing for us to know is there are these enzymes that some bacteria make, restriction enzymes. These are sequence specific DNA cutters. If you apply a specific enzyme onto any DNA molecule, it will search the whole DNA for that specific nucleotide sequence that it can cut and it will make a cut. It's almost like molecular scissors. We can use those enzymes. These are isolated from some bacteria. It's almost bacterial defense mechanism. Any foreign DNA, like viral DNA enters into bacteria, bacteria can chop that DNA off. Of course, bacteria protects their DNA by some other mechanism. But humans use these restriction enzymes for gene cloning. And this is how you do it. You take a plasmid and you generate something called as restriction map of that plasmid. That map will actually tell you which enzymes can cut where on this plasmid. Now your job is to take this plasmid and find out one enzyme, mark my words, okay? Only one enzyme that can cut only once. Because if I cut this plasmid, it's a circular DNA. If I cut it three times, I'm going to get multiple pieces out of that plasmid. That's not what I want. I want to either cut it just once or maybe cut it twice to put take a fragment out. And that's what I have shown in this gel picture. We actually verify in the lab whether this has really worked or not. In, this is the gel picture from my own research lab where we cut this plasmid, we run it out on the gel, okay? So this is just the plasmid, not cut with any restriction enzyme. If I cut this plasmid with two restriction enzymes, that will, ge that will generate two fragments. One of this fragment that's cut by two enzymes will be out, that's what's shown here, and the rest is the remaining plasmid. You can actually see that on the gel. But for now, for this lecture, we can just focus on one enzyme. Let's at least design our experimental strategy to cut this plasmid with one enzyme and that will generate these kind of sticky ends. Then what you could do is, let's say human insulin gene, this is how industry prepares insulin these days. And I'm sure in Dr. Bhupati's lecture last time, you talked about insulin gene. If I want to start a company to make lots and lots of insulin and sell it to people, I can take human insulin gene and clone it into a plasmid. 
I will have to just plan out, just figure out which enzyme, which restriction enzyme to cut the plasmid with. Maybe just one enzyme that will give a single cut and just open up this plasmid. Then what I have to do is make sure that that same restriction enzyme does not cut, does not cut anywhere in the insulin gene. I will introduce, deliberately introduce by a technique called as PCR, um, the same restriction enzyme sites at the end of that gene, but it should not cut anywhere in between. If it does, it will cut my gene into two pieces. I don't want that. Okay, so two things we need to take care of. That restriction enzyme that we choose should cut our plasmid just once, and it should not cut the gene that we want to insert into our plasmid. If you can take care of those two things, chances are good that you will be successful in your cloning. And then what we do is this. We take a plasmid, the plasmid of our interest, we digest it with one enzyme, let's say E. coli R1, isolated from E. coli, cut the plasmid open, introduce E. coli R1 sites into, uh, at the end of this insulin gene by PCR, this is beyond our lecture right now, how to introduce these sites, we know how to. But what we could do is make sure that eco R1, since we use eco R1 to cut the plasmid, we should make sure that eco R1 does not cut anywhere in human insulin gene, okay? If it does, we cannot use that enzyme. We have to use some other enzyme that cuts plasmid just once. Once we have that synthetic recombinant plasmid ready, we can just deliberately put it into bacterial cells and allow them to grow. They will grow within 24 hours and you will have lots of insulin protein, human insulin protein made in bacterial cells. Then all you have to do is apply your chemistry techniques, purify that insulin, sell it and become a millionaire. So genetic engineering, okay? Let's have a try of this. I'm going to point out this database to you. AdGene, is a, it's a huge plasmid repository and we are going to use this plasmid, POC19, okay? So I'm going to point out to this link to you. It will take you directly to that plasmid sequence. Your job is to tell me which enzyme you will use to cut this plasmid in order to insert human insulin gene into it, just the name of that enzyme. So what you will have to do is go to this website, add gene, look into the PUC19 sequence, look into all of the restriction enzymes, the name of the enzymes that cut this plasmid just once. Then you will have to obtain human insulin gene sequence from GenBank in the same way I told you before, okay? And generate a restriction map of human insulin gene. I'll quickly show you how to do that. We, we are going to use an NEB cutter software to do that. Again, it's online, okay? So follow up on this link. I'm opening it in my web browser and I will be sharing my entire screen again so you can see what I see. This is the PUC19 sequence. It lists the entire sequence of the plasmid in FASTA format. Now, if you go over here, say analyze sequence. This might take a second to load it. It makes you, uh, for you, the restriction map of this plasmid. So these are several restriction enzymes. If you just hover your mouse pointer on those, it even tells you where and which sequence they cut. So figure out um, which enzymes can cut just once in this plasmid. Of course, don't disrupt the antibiotic resistance gene. We want to keep that intact. Um, you can go to enzymes right here and it tells you how many enzymes can give just one cut. Now let me introduce you, how will you, oh, of course, I, I told you how to search for human gene sequence, but how will you make a restriction map of human insulin gene? Let's say that you obtain the gene sequence from GenBank. Well, for that, you have to go to NEB Cutter. I'll post the link in Zoom text chat window. This is where you need to go to. Copy paste human insulin gene sequence right here. For now, I'm just going to put a random sequence, okay? Human insulin gene should be linear, so just click submit and it will generate a restriction map for you. 
It will also list single cutters. For a long gene, it will list single cutters. It will list zero cutters. So what you need to make sure is the enzyme that you picked to cut PUC19 does not cut human insulin genes. So it should be in the zero cutters. That's what you need to make sure. Okay, I'm posting this NEB cutter link in the Zoom text chat window so you can use this for human insulin. And tell me, all you got to tell me is which enzyme you are going to use. There you go. So somebody is asking, how do we deal with some post translational modifications that are needed for certain human or any other eukaryotic protein? So um, that is where the buffers come into picture. Remember, bacteria will make that protein in them, but companies are going to isolate that protein and store it in a buffer that has specific conditions. It essentially mimics the cytoplasmic environment of human cells, and then they are going to sell it. So that buffer takes care of proper three-dimensional shape, and they will even include some kind of cofactors into that buffer that protein needs to bind to in order to be active. Okay, so that, that's a really good question. Companies do take care of that if really they are dealing with a protein that has some special requirements. Keep in mind, in this activity, all you got to tell in the text chat window is the name of that enzyme, which cuts just once in PUC19 plasmid, but does not cut in human insulin gene. That's all we are looking for. Very simplistic planning out as of now, just to begin with. You can have a very complicated cloning strategy mapped out. When we really want to do that experiment, you can have a directional cloning. If you want to insert human insulin gene in certain direction, you can do that with two enzymes. But to learn, let's start simple. And there is no one specific correct answer. There could be several single cutters in PUC19 that don't cut human insulin gene. So as long as we have a couple of responses in the text chat window, we are almost there um, towards the end of our lecture. We have one little interesting activity remaining to do. And that has to deal with proteins. So we, uh, we played around with some DNA sequences. We also played around with some RNA viral genomes, whole genome sequence alignments. We actually figured out which patient is infected with a pathogen. And now we have to do something with protein sequences in our last activity. And we do have time for that. So maybe wait a minute or two and see what responses we get from here.
Sure. If it's a single cutter, if it cuts PUC19 just once, and if ACC1 does not cut entire human insulin gene anywhere, you can use that. Like I said, there are several correct answers for this. As long as you are doing it right, you are on the right track to map out this cloning strategy. Again, it's not going to be a directional cloning because we will be using just one restriction enzyme. And you can introduce ACC1. If you want to use that, you can deliberately introduce ACC1 site at the end of human insulin gene and amplify the whole gene by PCR. That's a different deal. But first thing is to make sure that ACC1 does not cut anywhere in between human insulin gene. If that's the case, we are good to go, okay? So fantastic, at least we have one response. That is fabulous. So now it's time for me to introduce that last activity to you all about proteins. Um, again, I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint for a while. Three D structure of each protein is important. Okay, so if we are presented with a random protein sequence, just a primary structure of protein, okay? Single letter abbreviations of amino acids. All we know is that this is the amino acid sequence of the protein. What structure could it possibly have? We can solve the real structure by using complicated experiments, but that takes time and money. But can we at least predict the structure of the protein? Can we even predict the name of the protein that this structure could be very close to? Well, yes, these days we can do that. Servers, web servers like this can help us do that. So all you have to do is just copy paste this protein sequence into this HH thread web server, just, so just follow this link. I'm going to keep this slide on. You will see the search window. Just copy paste this protein sequence in there. That job is going to take a few minutes to run, okay? But um, we will have last 10 minutes for you to answer questions and we still have about seven minutes to end this lecture. So if somebody can tell me what this protein is and how its structure could look like, a picture of that structure or how would, would it look like? Maybe put that into our Google Drive folder. That would be great. And you have the remaining time to maybe catch up on some previous activities or tell me the outcome of this activity. Again, this is just, I'm just giving you a random protein sequence and I'm asking you to model its 3D structure. We don't have to have any software installed. All we have to do is just use this open source web server. So nifty tools out there, people. When, when I used to think about bioinformatics, I used to have that one apprehension, one fear that I might need to do some coding. Well, coding is another aspect in bioinformatics. I would say that it's little advanced aspect of bioinformatics. If you can code, then you can actually get some simpler things done on your computer itself. You don't really need web servers. But what if you want to get some advanced thing done? For example, protein 3D structure modeling. Self-coding a program to do that kind of a thing is complicated. It does require some advanced knowledge of computer programming. Not everyone has that, but they can still do the bioinformatic tasks using these publicly available tools. And that's what bulk of bioinformatics is about. So. I'm waiting for the outcome of this. I'm going to keep this slide on, shared with you, and I'm going to have one eye on the text chat window. Yes, 
it is aquaporent. It is the protein that can transport water molecules inside human cells, and it's human aquaporin. Okay, so try to try to click on those links that uh, come to you as um, these uh, result, and those links will take you to PDB protein data bank. And that's where you will be able to actually see the structure of aquaporin. Sometimes it's a tetramer of circular ring-like proteins. It's almost like a membrane channel. This is a membrane protein, sits on human cell membranes. Almost all of the cells have it, okay? And this is just to transport water molecules through human cell membrane. Otherwise our membrane repels water because I'm sure some of the biology majors, you have learned this, Membrane is hydrophobic, at least from the inner side of it due to that phospholipid bilayer. So the question in front of scientific community was, well, how does water go through? Well, proteins like aquaporin, there are several of them. They help water come into human cells, okay? So great job, people. If you still have to catch up on some activities, you can do so. Otherwise, keep working on this activity. It takes time. Depending on the internet, it takes time for the servers to run sometimes. However, the good thing about web servers is um, that once you submit the job to them, it is their computer that runs. It doesn't really take the memory of our computer. And so they are fantastic to get some high-end jobs done in bioinformatics. So hopefully, this lecture gave you some introduction about FASTA format of sequences. We played around with homology alignment of some DNA sequences. We actually aligned five whole genomes of um, human coronaviruses. We actually figured out the infected patient, okay, just a mock activity, just for fun. We actually uh, modeled a three-dimensional structure of a protein all on internet. So all of these fun activities, I hope it gave a primer on bioinformatics to you all. Furthermore, if you do have questions, we will have time to take questions at the end of my lecture and we are almost there. So thank you so much for having me and sharing some basics of bioinformatics with you. Here is my contact information though. If you do have questions down the road, don't hesitate to contact me. The best way to reach me is by my email, okay? So thank you, and this is when I will take any questions you may have. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Raji. And now we have about 12 minutes to, <laughs> to yeah. nine. So maybe we can have two or three questions Please, if you have question, you can raise your hand or write it in the chat. Pak Guntur, could you please take a look at the uh, the YouTube as well? Maybe they have question in the YouTube. For now, uh, not yet. Where is the chat? Oh, you, you maybe open the mic if you like to. Is anybody willing to raise any question to Dr. Rajay? I really like that people ask questions as they were doing the activity. Yeah, I think so. some of the... Maybe people are still trying to do the activity because <laughs> it takes time. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, uh, I think so. Jeremiah? It might be you like to, because uh, he, he, he did it in the chat. I think there's a number of. 
And then, uh, Shalom Hilton, it might be you like to raise a question. Well, we should address the question in the chat that has been raised and previously, and you already uh, answered briefly about uh, on this question, Professor uh, Dr. Rajay. So, uh, so, the question uh, is there any question? No. Is there any raise? No. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, just. Uh, just I, I. I. just uh, have a a question to just if. Dr. Rajay, so if we just uh, a, a sequence, uh, any 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 sequences, so so they'll they'll be, be appear or in the in the, in the in the, in the uh, using the, the the software or or not? So I just I just put it, uh, the, the the sequences, any sequences, would like to put. So what will happen? So uh, any sequence, as in DNA sequence, in what software would you like to put? Yeah, the, like uh, the last one. So the the, 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 the last one. So oh, the last sequence. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. So uh, that's a protein sequence, yes. and I yes. named it as unknown protein. Yes. Um, just because of you know uh, allowing students to find out what protein that is, but if you can put that same sequence into the now that's a good question without even predicting the three D structure. If you want to know what protein that is, yeah. what you could do is. Um, I'm going to share my screen for a while again here, and we are going to go to the web browser. What you could do is this. Go to NCBI Blast, and notice that although we use nucleotide Blast, there are several other types of basic local alignment search tools. You can go to this blast and put that copy and paste that protein sequence right here and hit search and it will tell you the name of the protein. So if we are just looking into the name of the protein, that unknown protein, you can get it from right here. But if you are looking into a possible structure, then of course you don't have, you know, blast will be of no use to you. You will have to use those structure prediction algorithms. Okay, thank you. Hey, maybe one question from me, uh, Dr. Rajay. If we are uh, elucidating the the, uh, the not the structure, the sequence of a protein, for example, and we we publishing uh, we publish that the uh, that sequence, will it be automatically uh, published in a database, or do the person who do the research has to publish that? Uh, sequence in database themselves? Good question. So if you um, have, let's say, identified a new protein sequence or even gene sequence, yes. uh, you will have to separately go to NCBI GenBank. It's a free account. You can create that account and submit the sequence with your name. And then you can quote the paper, the published paper that um, you know essentially lists the several experiments that you did to come up to that sequence. But you will have to actually submit it yourself to the database that you want to put into. Okay, so so uh, in other words, if we browse to the database, there might be some uh, information that are available in the literature, in the, in the paper or journals or everything that has not been uh, in the database yet. Yes, 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 for sure, uh -huh. yes. So uh, now, now talking about human genes, since we have had a whole human genome project already done, most of those genes are sequenced for humans, but there are several other organisms. Their genomes are not sequenced. So not everything is known. What databases show us is what's known and what's submitted to them. Now that brings me to another point. Could those sequence have errors? What if? Mm -hmm. I'm sequencing a gene and by doing the experiment, I have a couple of nucleotides error in that. Maybe the real sequence is different, but in my experiment, I had some error. I went, I rushed myself and published that sequence on GenBank. Then the whole world is essentially seeing an incorrect sequence. What we are seeing is what people put in there. 
Mm. So we have to be very careful about mm. what sequence we are actually using, where it is coming from. And that's why I told the whole audience, spend some time into the features section, see who has put that sequence, how many people have used it, what is the source of that sequence? Does the length of that sequence even correspond to the gene? Oh, okay. So we have to be very critical about what are in the database, yeah? Very careful, yes, exactly. Because this is something that people put. And mm -hmm. as we know, uh, being chemists or biologists, that experimental errors are always possible. And if there is an experimental error, it reflects in the sequence. In fact, um, I can actually show you, we have one more question. I can show you where we can find some information so again, let me, um, thanks for that question. It's a really nice question. Go back to NCBI, GenBank, and here we go. I can just pull up any random nucleotide sequence, any sequence, human ACTB. And I'm just going to click on a random link and show you what I mean by that. So this is the GenBank accession number for this sequence. But after the decimal point, the number that you see is the number of times that sequence has been revised. So this sequence has been just submitted once and that's it. Sometimes that number could be 14. In that case, people revise the sequence. People, some, some other people maybe, they review the errors, they correct the errors and submit the new sequence. So you will see for every submission, this number will keep increasing. So that's the virgin number of that sequence. Okay. So we should use the, 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 the highest number actually, yes? The latest version, the if latest. it's available. Yeah. Uh, I think there's some, I think it's a question from the chat box. Yes. It is known that polycystronic mRNAs are common in prokaryotes. Yeah, it is known. Then how do we know which sections correspond to which expression in a single strand? Now, that's a fantastic question. So in polycystronic messenger RNAs, how do you know where the translation starts and where translation ends. Well, those start and stop codons, those are universal, okay? So even bacteria are going to have start and stop codons in their messenger RNAs. So that, I'm going to put something in the text chat window, ORF prediction. Look into that. There are several tools to predict open reading frames for each messenger RNA, although we did not do this activity due to time limitations in this one little lecture, you can actually just Google the same thing, ORF, open reading frame prediction, put that polycystronic mRNA sequence in there and it will give you three. If it really codes for three proteins, it will give you three open reading frames. And you can straight away know that, well, these are the proteins. So thanks for that question. Another question. See, the application of bioinformatics is still limited seeing how much potential it possesses that we have displayed. How do you suggest it can be applied to industrial application and which industry section will be? Um, I would say biotech industry would most benefit, even chemical industry would most benefit. So that genetic engineering section that we uh, were looking into, you can take pretty much a gene from, you can actually take antibiotic gene from, um, from um, certain fungi, clone it into a plasmid and make antibiotics. You could do that in some eukaryotic cells. That's possible. Synthetic version of any kind of a protein is, um, could be done with bioinformatic, at least planned out. Experiment planning could be done with bioinformatic tools. It can be used in chemistry as well. There are some chemi-informatic tools, molecular interactions, three-dimensional. Can this molecule fit into this molecule? That brings me to a concept of drug design. If I'm generating a drug molecule, will it even act in human body? What are the potential interacting partners? You can predict this all on computer. Is it possible to search for silencing genes such as RNAi 
Yes, there are separate databases for RNA interference. So yes, it is possible. Although we did not go through that. Yes, it is possible. Okay. We have time I'll, limitation. <laughs> yeah, that's this is quite nice. Uh, please move in. Yeah, I think we have to close the session. <laughs> and yeah, this is this is very interesting talk. Uh, thank you. I would like to thank you for very interesting talk this morning, Dr. Raje. You already introduced us to some interesting tools that we can play with further. Yeah, I I uh, I tell it again. Play further <laughs> because it's very interesting to play oh, wow. with it. And you also introducing us to a different kind of libraries. I, I said uh, database as library for us to uh, to go further with what is in the cell and what feature can we do with that. And uh, to conclude with, I would like to share screen. Okay, so this is actually a part of a. Uh, Monday morning lectures on bioprocess engineering and we are on the second class. Uh, next week we will have another class on fundamental of anaerobic digestion process and this is uh, actually in conjunction with 80 years of chemical engineering education in Indonesia. So you are all welcome to join the next class next week on fundamental of anaerobic digestion process in the same time Monday morning seven to nine so be prepared <laughs> get up early <laughs> and listen to this interesting talk and next week we will have professor ramaraj mupati and it will be host by professor chandra setiadi so i would like once again thank you all for listening and joining uh, this lecture today maybe uh, pak guntur would like to take the picture of all of us okay Please turn on your camera. Then we can uh, provide your, your share screen for me. Yeah, I will. I will stop my share screen. <laughs>